seven, six, five, four, three, two. Engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our Hi, my name is Natalie Battaglia, and I'm an astronomer at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. NASA is home to the Kepler mission. Kepler is a space telescope searching for planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. NASA wants to find out if there's life beyond the solar system. So Kepler is looking for planets like Earth in size that could be potentially habitable. So I'd like to talk to you today about how Kepler is finding these planets. Finding planets is difficult because planets are so, so tiny and so far away. If you could imagine that my body is a star, a planet like Earth would be smaller than a pea, smaller, about the size of a rice grain. And they're very far away, millions of miles away. So we don't just take telescopes and point them out into the galaxy and take pictures until we find one. We have to use our imagination to think about ways of inferring the existence of these planets. And we do that by observing the stars themselves. Kepler doesn't actually see stars. Stars are too far away, they're too distant. All we see is the light that comes from the star. Kepler measures the brightnesses of stars very, very accurately, and it hopes that some planets will sweep right in front of the star, transiting across the face of that star. Just like you saw with Mercury right there, crossing the disk of our sun. Kepler doesn't see the planet itself, but it will perceive the presence of the planet because it will see a change in the, in the amount of light that it collects from the star. When Mercury passed in front of the disk of our sun, Mercury casts a shadow out into space. And if there's a telescope there, that shadow will sweep across the face of the telescope, and the telescope will perceive that as a momentary dimming of light. And that's how we infer the existence of these planets. We look for these tiny dimmings of light that occur when the planets in their orbit around the star pass right between the disk of the star and our telescope, casting a shadow out into space and sweeping it across the face of our telescope. So let's go see a model of how this works. This is a model of the Kepler spacecraft. It's a space telescope. So inside there's a mirror that's about one meter across. That mirror collects light from stars in our galaxy and it takes a picture of that light on a little detector, kind of like what you have in your cell phone cameras. Except the detector for taking pictures in your camera is about the size of my thumbnail. The detector inside of this space telescope is about this big. Uh, this is an orrery. An orrery is a model of a planetary system. So in the middle you have a star, or a light bulb, that represents the star, and orbiting around it, in this case, are two planets. In this model orrery, we also have something that represents the Kepler spacecraft. In fact, there's a little detector there that is measuring the amount of light coming off of that light bulb. So I can make the planets orbit by turning this crank. And when I orbit them, when I make the planets orbit, this light sensor will measure a dimming of light when this little blue pan planet passes in front of the star. When a small planet like this passes in front of the star, the spacecraft itself will measure a dimming of light that lasts about 12 hours. On this computer screen, we can see what actually happens with the brightness measurements that the telescope is making. On the computer monitor, we see this red trace. The red trace is a measure of brightness as a function of time. So our light sensor is measuring the brightness of the light bulb, and it shows the brightness at every moment of time. And as Kepler is looking at the stars, the brightness kind of looks like this. It's pretty boring. Not much is happening. But when a tiny planet passes in front of the disk of the star, all of a sudden we get this tiny dimming of light that happens. It lasts just some hours, uh, but if we can detect that dimming of light, that's a telltale signal that there is a planet orbiting that star. This technique for finding planets is called the transit technique. Kepler has been using this for four years, and in that four years, Kepler has found almost 4,000 planets orbiting other stars, hundreds of which are the size of Earth. 
Uh, let's go see some of Kepler's discoveries. And this is one of my favorites. Um, what you see here is kind of what we imagined that this particular planet Kepler discovered might look like. Uh, its name is Kepler 10b. Kepler 10 is the name of the star that it orbits, and it's a star very much like our own sun, um, except it's 560 light years away. Kepler 10b is actually kind of the same size as Earth. It's only 40% larger. So why does it look so different? It has this glowing side on the right. Uh, the reason it looks so different is because it has a very different orbit. Kepler 10b orbits very, very close to its star. Instead of taking 365 days to go around once, it only takes 20 hours. So this luminous side that you see, the temperatures there are high enough to melt iron. So any kind of rock that is on the surface of this rocky planet is going to be melted. It's going to be lava. So this planet has an entire hemisphere that's larger than the Pacific Ocean. And it is an, or an ocean of sorts, but it's an ocean not of water. It's an ocean of lava. Kepler 10b is about 40% larger than the Earth, but it's about four times the mass of the Earth. And if you know the mass and you know the radius, you can calculate the surface gravity. So now with your knowledge of how to calculate the mass of a planet, you could apply that knowledge to other planets orbiting other stars. And you could calculate what the surface gravity would be on this planet and know how much you would weigh if you were to stand on it with your lava boots.